Who are the different groups of people in the New Testament? And why was Jesus addressing them directly with what they needed to do to see the kingdom of God? That's what we'll talk about today. Faith in Jesus must be personal, but it cannot be private. Rick Warren. Hi there. I'm going to release this a little bit early just to give you a heads up. I moved the website and the feed to the Bible in Small Steps. If you also listen to that podcast and you don't see episode 13, it is published. For whatever reason you don't see it, delete the podcast and then re-add it to your podcatcher of choice. Some of them worked and some of them just stopped publishing. So again, if you don't see it, just re-add the podcast and it will be there. All right. Thanks so much. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Because in the Bible in Small Steps, we're reading about the people in the time of Jesus during the Gospels. We're going to talk a little bit about who these people groups were. Sometimes I think it might be a little bit confusing. I grew up Jewish, and so I tend to know, I think, a little bit more about who people are. But I wonder, at some points, do people really know the Pharisees, the Sadducees, different groups that like John the Baptist and, and maybe Judas belong to? So we'll talk a little bit about that. It makes it harder for us to understand the Bible when we don't understand the people he's talking about when he talks about these different groups. So that's where I thought we would identify some of the groups. It was a complicated time. I think people tend to think of the time of the Bible is there were Jewish people and there were not Jewish people, and everyone sort of fell into one of those two buckets. It's a lot more complicated than that. You have to realize that this is an area, hotbed of political fighting, of nations conquering nations, of turmoil in general. To understand it, you realize that, first of all, you know, there was the Babylonians, the Syrians way back in the time, but now we had the Greeks in 330 BC and Alexander the Great who plowed right through the Holy Land and took over the whole area. And then the Romans came in, swallowed the Greek culture and became Greeks. They became a very Greek like culture. But now the Romans ruled this area with an iron fist. And there were people who were trying to rebel. There were factions of people who were trying to get along with. There were groups of people who would be probably more like me who would just say, I'm going to go out into the countryside so I can avoid this entirely. And there were people who were waiting for the Messiah and others who, quite frankly, were not waiting for the Messiah. I bought an amazing book when I was in the old city of Jerusalem about the people at this time because I was just so fascinated to read more about the people who lived in the places I got a chance to see and walk through when I was there. It's really fascinating to do a deep dive on any of this. So let's first talk about the Pharisees. The Pharisees are mentioned a lot by Jesus, and they were a group that came from around the second century BC. They made it all the way through the first century BC, and they were strict about adhering to the rules of the law, They also believed in the prophets like Isaiah and Nehemiah, so they were also looking for the future. They believed in an afterlife. They believed in a Messiah coming. They were people who wanted to do the exact right thing. And we'll talk a little bit in a moment why they went wrong, but Pharisees mean separated ones. I got a chance when I was in Jerusalem to basically have lunch with the group of people who overtook this position. They, were, they lived in a place called Mia Sharim, and they looked for people who were Jewish Americans, essentially, who were walking around the Temple Mount, just kind of interested, interested in seeing what people were doing. And they would invite people to come to their house for Sabbath meals because they wanted to teach you more about them, hoping that you would become more like them. I mean, that's fine. And it was interesting, and I got to ask a lot of questions and see what they were about, but they were really trying to follow every rule. But back to Israel in 29 AD, the Pharisees were in opposition to what we were called the Sadducees. We'll talk about them in a moment. But they all fought for influence inside the temple between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But the one thing they got along with and agreed with was they didn't like John the Baptist and they didn't like Jesus. So they found some sort of agreement in that. Most of them were more middle class or poor. They didn't hold high power positions that paid really well. 
They were, in some cases, rabbis, priests from the temple, probably from the tribe of Levi. If we remember all the way back, we'll talk a little bit about this in the next podcast, that we had tribes of Israel. They came from the tribe of Levi, which was given the issue of being the priest class of the Jewish people. Most of them came from that. Some of them may have been members of the Sanhedrin. We'll talk about who they were in a bit, but that was a court. And there was the big Sanhedrin, the big court, like think of it, the federal court. There were, and there were smaller courts throughout the land associated with synagogues. Their leaders were called rabbis and teachers. Nicodemus was one of them. Gamaliel, who I think was Paul's teacher, was one of these. And Many of them were mentioned in the Talmud and the Mishnah, which were rabbinic writings from many centuries. Some of them were trained to read and write and were scribes. Some of them even, in particular, became disciples of Jesus. Again, this was a group of people who were trying to follow God's rules. They wanted to be in a relationship with God. They just had it wrong. And we'll talk about why they had it wrong here in just a moment. But some of them also became disciples. He even wrote about it in the Talmud and the, how some of them listened to Jesus, agreed with Jesus, was taught by Jesus. Some of them were their first followers. They were, for the most part, opponents of Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus speaks of them as a pit of vipers, that they were hypocrites, that they were blind, that they couldn't see, they couldn't understand what he was saying, that they weren't getting what he was trying to say. Paul was a Pharisee. Nicodemus, as I mentioned before, a Pharisee. And the idea was, is that the reason that there was such a problem with them is that they would say something, and I've given this example before, what is the Sabbath? Well, don't break the Sabbath. So they came up with rules about ways you could eat and not eat during the Sabbath. There were rules about whether you could heal someone or pray for someone on the Sabbath. There were rules about Sabbath starting exactly when you could see three stars in the sky. These were rules that God never put on anybody. And suddenly they were encasing God's rule in this outer core of rules, trying to get you to prevent you from doing it. Think about the movie Footloose, right? You say, oh, well, you shouldn't be having sex before marriage. So we're going to prevent you from dating, meeting people of the opposite sex by not dancing. You can't have any dances because dancing leads to this, this, and this. So now we're going to put rules outside of the rules just so that we don't accidentally break one of them. That's exactly what they were doing. And Jesus said that they are weighing things around people that God never intended that to happen. And again, when I, and I'm going to just keep talking about how much I hated Sabbath, but I wasn't allowed to play with certain toys. I wasn't allowed to read certain books. I, I was told I could read a book, but I wasn't allowed to turn the page. So then I started reading like the Encyclopedia Britannica because it had a lot of things on the page, but it was not what God intended. And so because they were putting on rules, it made people dislike faith in God because they were telling people things that God didn't say. They believed in studying the Torah was what they were meant to do all the time. They spent most of their time doing that, and they were involved in the local synagogues and the one in Jerusalem with study, interpretation. These were learned people, and so people went to them for opinions about what it is that you should do. They didn't like the Romans, as many people didn't. But as long as the Romans just let them live out their religious beliefs, they didn't do much to fight it. Eventually, after the point where G when we just got to this in Matthew 12, when Jesus started healing people on the Sabbath, that was the end. They were ready to plot against Jesus and meaning take him out. They did believe in the strict observance of the law. And so again, because they put all the different customs and traditions but their traditions became piled on to God's law. What you wear, what you do, how you say things. And then they started doing something that was kind of interesting, almost like a, a lawyer view of it. Well, you would say, and this is what Jesus hit out on them a bit, 
you shouldn't murder your brother. Murder is against the Ten Commandments. Well, but if I stone you nearly to death, is that murder? Or honor your mother and father. But instead of helping them in their old age, I give that money to the temple. Well, who could be mad at me for giving money to God? They were getting out of now, in this legal sense of it, of the obligations that they were supposed to do that God did say to do by trying to figure out the letter of the law. I said something that when we were in college, we were trying to figure out, well, what exactly is the sin when you're dating a man? What is the exact sin? What's the fine line? And trying to come up with exact specific things that is under the line and over the line. And that is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, this is how I want you to treat people. You're not following the Ten Commandments by honoring your parents. You're not not murdering people because you hate them. You're just turning them over to the Romans who will kill them so that you don't have to kill them. And then you're saying you're not sinning. I mean, there were so many ways they were getting out of these rules because first, when you become an expert at the rules, then you create the rules around the rules. And because you're sort of the religious lawyer who wrote all the rules, you you know how to squeak out of them too. And that was where Jesus was having a problem with them, which then in the end makes them hypocrites. The Sadducees? The Sadducees were another group at that time. These were more elite. They were aristocrats. They were well off. They believed in only the Torah, the first five books of the scripture. They didn't believe in the prophets. Therefore, they didn't believe in life after death. They didn't really believe in a Messiah per se. They went into allegiance with the Romans trying to basically negotiate, and you can see where they would think this, we're going to negotiate a peace. The Romans will leave us alone as long as we pay the taxes and we just get to do our things. We get to run the world like we want to do it. And they were probably in the school of Herod. Herod was a part of them because he was trying to figure out how can we get along with these Romans, not kick them out, but at least make them so they're not doing anything bad with us. So they were not unkindly trying to figure out a way without going to war, how to live with the Romans instead of how to get rid of the Romans. They didn't like the Pharisees because, again, the Pharisees believed in the the prophets too. So they disagreed on that. Plus, the Pharisees were probably pretty strict, didn't want you to do anything. And these guys, they were getting along to get along. And so they were kind of having more of a fun time. I don't want to say fun time, but they were living a better life under the Romans because they were just getting along. So again, they were wealthy. They were also Hellenized. We'll talk a little bit about that. But Hellenized Jews were ones who really appreciated, and again, the Romans really appreciated, the Greek culture, their sophistication, their philosophy. I mean, the Greek culture was amazing. And so they took on a lot of the aspects of Greek culture when the Greeks were there. And now that the Romans were there and also very Greek in their style, they were taking that on too. So they were considered to be Hellenized Jews that were there. They think that the temple itself was the only path to God, that we don't have relationships with God, that other temples have some relationship with God. But the one in Jerusalem, the temple was the only place to bring your sacrifices and your donations and come here to the main temple. They were the people who ran the temple with a tight fist and were bleeding people not, you know, to keep the temple going. Herod rebuilt the temple from when it was destroyed. And so he gave it back to them. And now this temple rulership was now ruling other people's lives, bringing the best of everything to them. And again, they also had the Roman support because the Romans were seeking peace. They, di- they didn't care what you did as long as you didn't revolt. And the Sadducees were helping them do that. Closely related to the Sadducees was the Sanhedrin. And this is the court, the Supreme Court. And the one in Jerusalem had 71 members, which was a high priest who was like the, the head of it, the president of it, 24 priestly service divisions And he was in charge of 24 other priests, then scribes, lawyers, elders, other people representing regular people, lay people in the community. And the word Sanhedrin means together with. 
meaning that they sit together and make decisions. The Jewish people looked at this as being their court system. So there were also Sanhedrins in their local temple as well. And so if you said, this man stole from me, you would bring it before this court system in order to get justice. And the big one in Jerusalem, again, was ruling for the entire Israeli nation, what's left of it, under the Roman rule. But that is where you got justice, too. And so and what's interesting, and I thought this when I was reading about it, usually there were two people appointed, one that was going to fight for acquittal of the person and the other one who was going to fight for conviction. Doesn't it sound familiar? So you get your defense attorney and then there's the prosecuting attorney. And then they would vote. And if the vote was for acquittal, the person would be set free. And if not, they would be condemned. The interesting thing about the Sanhedrin is that they were, like I said, interested in, one, maintaining the peace. But Herod is the guy who appointed most people in the Sanhedrin we see at the time of the Bible. He slowly but surely took out people who were in opposition of him and the Hasmonean rule which we'll talk about next week, he took people out that were in the other school, the Pharisee school, and started replacing it with people who were on his side of things, saw things the way he saw it. And slowly but surely, this Sanhedrin became a reflection of Herod. And so one of the things I mentioned in the Bible of Small Steps, Herod was dead by the time Jesus became a man. However, Herod, in his architecture, in his buildings, in his form of government, in his relationship with the Romans, and now with this court system, he is still haunting Jerusalem with his presence. We also had head priests. We had regular priests. And so if we think all the way back, I mentioned this before, Levi was the tribe who was supposed to be the priests, the people who sacrificed and did sacrifices for the Jewish people. But at some point, you know, it starts to break down a little bit. But that was the idea. And so for anyone who was in this position who was Jewish and couldn't be, they would support the temple even if they couldn't be a priest or a rabbi or something like that. And so the priests were again in charge of the temple. The high priest was appointed every year. And you, if you remember the name Caiaphas, Caiaphas was the high priest. And so he was appointed to basically run the whole temple system. They found the tombstone of Caiaphas, so that's what's exciting about it. But Jesus tells like the priests, the scribes, the elders as people trying to kill him, and they were. At some point, like I said, when the Pharisees were just done with him, they turned him over to be sought by the Sanhedrin. The scribes are going to be educated people. These are the people who read and write and maybe even do legal documents. These are, are learned people. They would even be responsible for copying the scripture. And so the reason the Bible is so accurate and why there's only like 40 lines that are different from each other in all the scripture is because it was meticulous work. There was some regional language differences, but every dot, every piece of ink. I mean, I think he's even talked about it. Every iota of it had to be perfect. It had to be perfect or the entire document got thrown out. And because he was written on scrolls, you couldn't just rip out a page. The whole scroll was done. So this was a very detailed amount of work. But that's why we have integrity in the Bible. And so the scribes, like I said, were just a more educated version of this. And even sometimes like lawyers. We often hear the word elder. They say the Greek word for it is presper, like Presbyterian, a church of elders. And we mentioned the elders in the church, and these were also going to be maybe priests, maybe scribes, but people who were, again, wise people within the group who are there to offer advice, just like we have elders in our church, maybe. So let's talk about some people groups before we're done. The Levites I mentioned before were the priest class that came down from Aaron, that came down from the Levite family that were meant to be the people who were the priests. And John the Baptist, both his parents come from that priestly class. Isn't that interesting? The Herodians, I mentioned, were those were the people who were the family of Herod or believed in Herod, supported Herod. And Herod 
the great ruled over at one point Galilee and then the entire area of Jerusalem. His children, after he died, became in charge of it. Herod Antipas was the ruler during the life of John the Baptist. We hear a lot about Herod, and we hear a lot about Herod's family throughout the New Testament. They were also the ones requiring taxes being paid to Caesar, because again, Herod's family was striking a deal in order to make it work. One of the things I noticed is Herod the Great was very detailed. He wanted to know exactly when the Messiah and where the Messiah was going to be born. But his son, Herod the Tetrarch, wasn't that careful about it. He thought he was killing Jesus when he was killing John the Baptist. This was not a guy paying attention to the details. So Herod the Great was great for a lot of different reasons. And as I mentioned, would probably be remembered in modern times without references to the Bible. He built so many things with his money, his power, and his labor force that he was famous for his buildings. I was walking around the old city of Jerusalem, and I just admired some of these buildings that were near where I was staying when I stayed in the old city. And so I just looked up to see how that got built. And sure enough, Herod and his workforce built that. Isn't that amazing? Then there were the Zealots. The Zealots were revolutionaries. You know, we had the Maccabees who kicked the Greeks out. They crushed the Greek army, which was amazing. They were a very organized, well-formed group of people. The Zealots had war in the first Jewish war against Rome. They were revolutionary. Simon the Zealot was a Zealot. They wanted to kick the Romans out. They wanted war. They wanted to form a military to do it. They were considered to be people living in Galilee quite a bit because, again, Jerusalem is, you know, like think of it like Washington, D.C. If you were going to be revolutionary, you'd live in the middle of the wilds of Montana, not right in the middle of downtown D.C. That's why the Pharisees were kind of living in Galilee. They wanted away from the place. They didn't believe in taxes to the Romans. They didn't believe in the Romans' use of slaves and indentured people. They did terrorism against the Romans, trying to get them out, and many of them wouldn't pay taxes. It was a very religious, nationalistic group at that time. We had the disciples of John the Baptist. People thought that John the Baptist's followers lasted for 200 years after the death of John the Baptist. People felt he was Elijah reborn. Elijah to them was either going to be the Messiah or the person who was going to alert the Messiah so that if you followed him around, you would get to see the Messiah first. And of course, John wasn't Elijah. He was an Elijah kind of figure. He was certainly a prophet in the Old Testament style, but he wasn't what people thought he was who followed him most of the time. And they believe that he had possibly been what was in a group called the Essenes. Again, these were Maccabees, you know, the people who kicked out the Romans, and like dissidents living in the wilderness. If you could get away from the cities, then you could get away with the, without the corruption. They thought that everything in the city was evil. These relationships with the Greeks and with the Romans, evil. They were strict in their belief of the Torah. They believed the Messiah was going to come any moment. They did a lot of copying of scriptures, Torah, religious text, and they lived where people couldn't find them. I mean, I went out on a bus to Qumran to see where they found the dead scrolls, and I fell asleep on the bus. And when I woke up, everyone on the bus was gone. Must have been funny for them. And I went running off to go look for my group of fellow archaeologists, and guess what? I couldn't find them for a long while because this is a really desolate area. It is easy to be hidden in this area. And so when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, this was from about the, the second century BC through the first century AD, and that's where they had copies of Isaiah that were accurate to copies of Isaiah in 900 AD, which used to be our oldest scripture. We found pieces of writing about what it is to be righteous and what it is to be a Samaritan in these caverns. And there may be many more writings still there because, again, 
This wilderness is desolate and it is easy to hide away anything in it. And these were found in caves. They didn't believe in the temple worship because the temple was corrupt and it was in Jerusalem. And so they wouldn't go and support it. And they'd probably get troubled and taxed if they did. They thought that there were going to be two different messiahs, one an anointed leader and then one a more priestly religious leader. Jesus ended up being the religious leader, but also a king too. They had strict membership. They were also probably celibate, which means you're not going to get little Essenes around. And the Romans routinely went out into the wilderness and destroyed their encampments. They also believed in some kind of an apocalypse, which is when the Messiah was going to come and save everybody after this apocalypse. Very interesting group. They also lived very sparsely on avoiding anything like material and having meals together and eating from what was around them. Some of them took vows of silence. I mean, it's like an ancient monastery. Very interesting. And of course, we had the followers of Jesus. And the one thing that was interesting about Jesus is he spoke to the people of Israel. He had people who were Pharisees, people who were scribes. We had Matthew, who was working for the Romans. But one thing about the people who were followers of Jesus is they acted and called each other brothers and sisters. They pooled together resources. They helped each other. And they helped all the people around them. And when he died, they went out and spread the message to the point where it led to their death. All right, so we're going to end up here. Next week, we're going to talk about other people groups in the New Testament. So my challenge to you is think about if the New Testament was today, who would be the various people groups? Or what would they look like today? It's a little bit of an interesting thing. I, I feel sometimes it helps me to understand the Bible when I think about it in modern times. But all these different groups that we have, what would it look like if they all existed right now? All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. The website is finally moved and all the files and the feed is already there. It's all set up. And maybe I'll cross post. I don't know if those of you who are going to my website want to see both podcasts there or you just want to have one podcast in each website. I haven't figured that out yet. But please remember that if there's anything I can talk about, anything I can pray about, something you would like to hear or a book you would like to hear, please let me know. And remember, our steps through history and walking through people who are very much like us, just in a different time frame, starts with small steps. Small steps.